you, um, Mayor Chop, uh, we're just looking quickly when we haven't been able to see anything, but uh, Catherine will for look into it in further and see what she can Perfect. find. Appreciate it. Thanks. Okay. So, so to carry on, um, the next slide, we're just going to um, have a little review of how our water and billing components um, on our billing. The water rates um, are set up based on two separate components. We have a basic charge, which is the fi a fixed charge per meter, and it's based on the size of the meter. And it also covers the administration costs or your fixed costs um, like billing charges administration costs it's the cost for um, if we were if no one was to use any water we'd still have costs that we'd have to pay for the water to be available for potable water to be available and um, that's the portion that that's co um, is covering the second component of the uh, the water charge is the consumption charge and it's based on a per cubic meter it's the volume of water used by residents by commercial and industrial customers and again, if the fixed costs are approximately 50% of the total uh, requirement. So for example, our budget um, might be 8.4 million. So 50% of the $8.4 million that we'd have to um, collect from rates would be 50% um, from the basic charge and 50% from the consumption charge. That used to be uh, probably a number of years ago, it was uh, 30, 70 through the um, review that we did for the rate study, it was um, one of the items that we were requested to do was to change that and increase the um, percentages so that we weren't reliant on just consumption. So if con it was more stable revenue. If, uh, for example, if we have a really dry season, our water will have a large consumption, our rates will, will have a surplus and our rates will, won't go up as high, but if it's a really um, wet summer, it'll be opposite. So you have some stability. Um, with, the with the change from, a, I think it was 30-70 at the time. So 70% of our revenue was dependent on the consumption. So it left, left us very unstable on an annual basis.
through, through Mayor Chop, you, you are um, totally correct. There are a number of different um, methods of charging water and sewer rates. Um, during the 2016 uh, rate review, that was items were discussed with council on the options for the different types of rates. This was the recommended rate, um, and based on the the approved um, rate study at that time, those were the guidelines, um, and the the rate budget has been and the rates have been established in this document based on those guidelines. But definitely, there are different rates. There are different options that can be through a rate study relooked at. Sorry, part of that, um, you know, my concern a little bit is when we get into the percentage that's allocated uh, into the commercial water users and what our biggest uses are at the top, um, and that we're not actually subsidizing uh, some of that as residential uh, users. Um, the second um, item for the wastewater rates, wastewater rates also are based on two components, the basic charge and the consumption charge. Um, wastewater is based on the water used um, and the meter size for the water. There's, um, at this point in time, we have no uh, other method of charging wastewater. There, I don't believe there's a meter still that has, uh, that's accurate. Um, Chris may be able to respond th to that, but uh, at the last time uh, we did discuss this, um, that's, we kept the same percentage using the water as the basis for the charge for your wastewater. And again, wastewater, um, the 50 percent of the um, requirement to run the wastewater system is collected 50 percent from basic charges and 50 percent from the consumption charges. The next slide is um, what we were just referring to is the, uh, we were just talking about was the uh, a history of the consumption. I believe it's also in the report, so you can see that um, there has been, some, there was at one time, even prior to 2011, um, we noticed the conservation, definitely um, water, the water usage was declining, and you are correct, as water usage declines, rates do go up, because the basic components uh, that's driving um, the water rates, you have, so, you have a total rate requirement to run your water and wastewater systems, and you'll collect that money either through uh, your meat basic charge and your consumption charge. So if your consumption charge goes down, definitely your water rates will go up. Mr. Baird, I'm just wondering if you could maybe touch on this, but we keep hearing about the fact that we're running into capacity issues uh, at our plants, and yet the amount of water that we're consuming has not changed arguably it's decreasing over the years and i understand that perhaps this might be used more for calculation purposes but i'm just i don't know if you could kind of help clear up that confusion for me at least um sure um through you we're bringing a report uh to you february 5th that will talk about uh all the system capacities that we have in norfolk county and where we need to be uh, gearing up to add uh add capacity uh, there's no big surprise, but Simcoe and Port Dover are our main growth areas, and that's where we're seeing the pressures. Um, I, I'm just, just, it's hard for me to see at this angle here, but in terms of your question about the consumption going down. Um, From 2011, it's gone down. I mean, in here, I had originally just seen since 2016, but now I see back as far as 2011, we're actually using less water than we did back then. As a county. Yeah, what, what's interesting too, I think there's a couple things at play. Um, uh, first and foremost is, is the conservation effort. I mean, you can only conserve so much and then you still need to bathe and clean and, and do, all, do all these things. So there's a, this threshold that you're going to reach. But the other thing that we're seeing, because we know um, each year we've seen considerable or measurable uh, growth, say in residential, to use that as an example. But what's happening uh, over the last decade, and certainly we'll see that trend, is if you look at all the new homes that are being built right now, we used to use a factor of about three and th three and three quarter persons per home. There's more and more homes with just two people, or two and a quarter if you do the big division. So less, less population uh, using less water per household. Uh, so, I mean, those two lines, it, it, is, it is interesting to see why are we growing yet um, our water consumption is sort of leveled um, if we looked at the wastewater areas, which we will do also, um, 
one of the things we're seeing is lots of infiltration. So during a heavy melt or heavy rainfall, we have a lot of infiltration into our uh, sanitary systems, um, including sump pump discharges that are uh, being rerouted that way. So when we know if, we, if we're making a million cubic meters of water a day, we should be approximately, if we're not washing too many cars or watering too much lawn, we should see that million cubic meters being treated. Uh, but we're seeing on those big wet events, big um, surcharges to, to the system. So over the last 10 years, we've made uh, considerable effort to fix those leaky areas with in situ uh, work, replacing old infrastructure. As an example, Port Dover was uh, uh, synonymous with big spikes uh, just because of the, uh, the way their uh, storm systems worked. Um, rebuilt Main Street, St. George, St. Patrick, a lot of the old infrastructure in the main core is now really tight. Um, uh, you know, we're monitoring uh, where discharges people will still hook up some pumps, uh, but is nowhere near that limit. So that's adding a bit of capacity uh, in the wastewater area. Well, you can see the wastewater area is increasing. In fact, this yeah. last year more than ever, um, the number kind of jumped out of line. But I'm just talking more on the water side. I mean, yeah. we've been running at the same capacity year over year, and yet our rates are increasing year over year. And I understand that as you use less, your rates naturally go up, but we're not talking about a huge variation. Like they're pretty consistent over that period of time. Correct. So that's just where I struggle right now when this is supposed to be on a cost recovery basis. When those numbers are the same, what's going on? I understand we've got inflation and everything else happening in here, but there's also some pretty significant jumps in costs that are happening as well. That, and again, it's not talking about the sewage side of things. No, correct. Um, strictly talking right now. About a lot of our costs component. are capital costs and debt financing that add to our annual cost. We're still, still manufacturing the same amount of water. Uh, we're conserving it, but it still costs. Whatever it costs us to run that program, whether people uh, use water or not, we have these firm costs that we need to uh, account for. So it's not just salaries going up. It's paying for the infrastructure upgrades uh, through the capital area that comes back to the, the rate budget. Eighteen million four hundred forty-three thousand, and allocates it between the water and wastewater rates. So, as you can see from the table, um, for the proposed two thousand and nineteen rate, the basic charge for a fifteen millimeter, which is your your basic residential home meter size, is increasing from twenty-one twenty-five to twenty-one dollars and sixty-six cents. The consumption charge from one point three nine five to one point four four four. And on the wastewater side, from 2528 to 2582, and the consumption charge 1.647 to 1.702. And if we take that and we calculate it based on an average um, residential property that uses 11 cubic meters of water, the actual uh, total proposed from the 18th. The, the total cost from the 2019 proposed rates compared to 2018 will show an will have an increase of 2.1, $2.10 or 2.6% increase. That is slightly lower than if you're wondering why we're asking for a net rate requirement that's equal to 2.9%. This is a little less when you actually calculate the rates because um, the consumption we've left at the same level of estimated um, over the last two or three years, we've used 3.03 cubic million cubic meters. Um, and again, the actuals, you've seen the actuals, one year was lower. This year we're estimating it to be almost 3.03 million cubic meters. We're not sure exactly where that'll end up, but we, so we've maintained the same level of the consumption. But what's increased is we've increased the number of users because of new development. There's new meters, new residential homes, and that's why you see a slight decrease in the overall rates. And not the two, and not exactly 2.9 percent. Um, the next slide shows a uh, comparison of residential rates over the last nine years or so. Um, you can see in 2012 we had a rate increase as high as 7.6 um, and as low as 0.5 percent in 2014. Um, an anomaly was 2016. That's the year that we did a, a comprehensive. Um, and engaged in consult and uh, a consultant to do a detailed rate review. 
and um, that's where you see the 9.5% uh, decrease in rates. Um, some of the items that were changed, we used to have a uh, two, we had two rates, cubic meter rates, one for commercial and one for residential, and we have now have a uniform rate. So that's why you see the decrease in, in, the, in the rates. Um, but for 2009, again, we're, um, the monthly increase would be $2.10, representing a 2.6% increase. Could I um, ask, do you have a copy, do you guys have a copy that you would be able to provide us with this 2015 consultant's report? I've even seen it quoted in the newspaper, and yet that's the one report I can't seem to get a hold of. Most definitely, and I believe it's on it's on our website too, but we'll make sure that uh, we send the so link I just, for that. So I, I find it a little bit strange. We spent money on a consultant in 2015 to produce a report, and then all of a sudden we had a decrease of 9.5%. And then the following year, we jacked up rates 5.5%. Um, something's wrong with that consultant's report then in 2015, if that's what they told you to do in 2016, decrease rates and then go and slam people with higher rates. And now for our holding tank that we're just going to get into, we're still relying on a report, this 2015 report, that I'm, I'm already starting to question the validity of the data that was provided in that. Um, through the mayor, if I remember correctly, the, the main reason for the decrease, this is, um, we have to note though, this is just for a residential user um, using 11 cubic meters of water. The, if we looked at the commercial side, the commercial side of the house increased quite a bit, their actual rates, because we went from a two block system to a one block rate system. But that was all in the same report, right? It was yes, all yes, in it's in all in the same, same report. report. Yes. Okay. So Martin, sorry, just a, a quick question. Would it be fair to say when they were separate uh, charges through commercial and residential that Mayor Chop's earlier point of potentially having residential rates subsid subsidizing commercial, not that we're saying that's happening, but if that was occurring, that would have been eliminated as they were two separate charges previously? Um, through Mayor Chop to Councillor Martin. Yes, you're correct. The actual the rate study corrected that. So the residential customers were no longer subsidizing the commercial customers. And so, how did these two separate fees become one? I'm um, through um, Councillor Chop to um, Councillor Martin. The um, rate study model that was developed by the consultant actually included um, and did the calculations for that. And that is included um, in the in the report when we send you the link to it. Would you mind if we just took a five minute recess so we could just get a copy of the report for everybody? Is that possible? Is that okay? I have to find out where the link is. Well, I guess I'm I'm just I know we're going to get more into it now with the holding tank um, provisions coming up, and I just. I feel that so much is being relied on over time on this 2015 consultant's report, and yet nobody, I don't think, sitting here, has anybody seen it? I'll just have Maureen go pull it uh, up. So if we could take a five-minute uh, recess. And can we, sorry, uh, we literally have two slides left sure, in no the problem. presentation, and then that would probably be a great spot okay. to take a break. Okay. take a break at this point in time and pass it over to Sue. All right, so the next couple slides um, discuss the billing and collection. Um, Norfolk County uses an external billing agent to bill and collect water and wastewater bills. The current collection process has been in place since May 2017, shortly after the contract with the current billing provider began. The first step in collecting overdue accounts involves the billing agent attempting to remind account holders through a series of letters and phone calls. If reminders are ignored and accounts continue to go unpaid, the next step is to determine if the account holder is an owner or a tenant of the property. The billing agent provides listings of accounts and arrears to financial services and staff compares each account to the tax roll. If the account belongs to a property owner, the arrears are added to the tax roll and collected as taxes with priority lien status. If it's determined that the account holder is a tenant 
Public Works staff must investigate each account to determine if the service suspension is possible based on the connection type. For properties where the connection supplies only the tenant who's in arrears, the service may be disconnected until the account is in good standing. Where the service connection feeds multiple tenants, accounts are not disconnected, but instead are forwarded to the collection agency. Um, an interesting fact to note is the collection agency reported to us that at the end of November 2018, there were 72 active accounts with arrears totaling 64,000 who are not paying but continue to receive services because the county is unable to disconnect. Amounts received by the collection agency are remitted directly to the county and the county pays a commission back to the collection agency. Commissions in 2018 were approximately $8,000. Amounts deemed uncollectible by the collection agency are transferred back to Norfolk County to be written off or expensed to the rate supported operations. The proposed 2019 rate supported operating budget includes an expense line of 100,000 for write offs of uncollectible arrears. This is up 29,700 from 2018. The write offs in 2017 were 74,388, and the expected write offs in 2018 are 104,000. The total write offs between 2009 and 18 averaged 77,000 per year. Uh, there's some stats there um, up until the end of November. 178,000 in new arrears transferred to the collection agency. 433,000 total outstanding accounts with collection C close to year end. 219,000 in arrears were transferred to the tax roll, so 100% collectible. And our collection rate of arrears is approximately 5 to 9%. And if there are any questions, can answer them. Um, James, my understanding last year we ran a surplus, did we not? 100 and some thousand? Uh, yes, uh, Mayor Chop, that is correct. We had a surplus on both the water side and on the wastewater side. Both of them combined it was approximately between 800 and $900,000. And where does that show in, from last year? Where did that money go? Where did we put it? Uh, when we have a surplus in uh, water or wastewater, then that surplus is a contribution to the respective reserve. Uh, so we have a, a water and a wastewater reserve, a sort of like a, a uh, uh, rate stability. Thank you, that's the word I was looking for. Um, so that's where any surpluses are uh, booked to, and then the opposite is, is true as well. If we have a deficit, then we use that reserve uh, to fund the deficit. If we didn't do that, then, uh, for example, if we had a, a significant deficit in either the water or the wastewater uh, budget for uh, that particular year, the following year's rate payers would, would have to uh, make up for that shortfall. Okay, so if you can just, I, like, I thought the number was somewhere around 100,000, but combined the water and wastewater surplus was how much? 800? Is that what you said? I, w I would have to double check the financial statements, uh, but I, I know it was between 500 and a million dollars when they combined them. Okay, thanks. Everybody's um, okay, we'll taste, oh, Councillor uh, Taylor. <clears throat> so consumption as a whole is decreasing but I'm interested um, with increasing growth, how have the peak usage time, is peak usage increasing, decreasing as well along with this uh, consumption decrease? No, uh, no I mean just um, like in the mornings, people are using more water. Is that? Uh, through Mayor Chop. So in a t typical morning, you got your, you know, your six o'clock to nine o'clock peak. That's generally the, the peak for the day because people are getting up starting their work day. Um, we rely on uh, making water all through the night and putting it in standpipes as in the case of Waterford and Delhi, and towers as in Simcoe and Dover along with reservoirs. So 
we make water through the low times and discharge it that way. If we have a particularly um, hot stretch, we can actually see our water tower deplete. You know, it, it's sort of uh, two steps forward, three steps back. So we really need to watch that. That's why we have uh, water uh, watering bands and things like that during those hot hot stretches. And uh, we're trying to build resilience into the system, added capacity. We'll talk more about that next month when you've got some facts and how we go about adding to capacity and ensuring. Obviously, it's important to have a water supply on hand, but it's also equally important for firefighting purposes because a big fire can drain a lot of water in a very short time frame. So. Thank you. I had another question regarding capacities, but if we're going to be dealing with that in a month, I'll, I'll just wait. So um, there's no slides on the holding tank uh, and the user fees, or are we coming back to that after? Uh, to uh, Madam Mayor, there is uh, information on those rates in your budget document, and what we will be doing is going through page by page in the budget document after our break, and we can discuss it once we get to that page, if you like. Okay, very good. Thanks. So we'll just recess for five minutes. I'm just going to grab everybody a copy of that report. <laughs>
Everybody's back. We'll reconvene, and I don't know if, if you guys wanted to take it over again with your next steps. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. So we'll continue, and what we will do uh, uh, for the uh, remainder of the uh, the budget deliberation for rate is we will go through uh, the pages in your budget uh, document, starting with uh, 3-4, and basically Kathy will uh, go through uh, each page with you, and uh, uh, basically just if there's any questions related to those pages, uh, basically... Uh, uh, ask them once we get to them and if not we just continue on at the end of section three is the uh, new budget initiatives uh, that we can speak to once we get to uh, get to that point and uh, the appendices uh, at the end uh, basically has the rates there based on the uh, the proposed budget and uh, we perhaps at that point we can discuss uh, the, the holding tank rate which is obviously a, uh, an issue that we need to discuss If I might, just because we have so many people that have come here today specifically to hear the holding rate um, material as opposed to doing the other um, service charges and user fees, because I have a million questions about those too, perhaps it's better that we start with the holding tank uh, increases just because we're going to be cut off at 5 o'clock. Is that possible? Okay. Um, so to give you a bit of a, a background on how we... Uh, arrived at the rate today. Uh, back in 2016 when we did the rate, sorry, 15 when we did the rate study, uh, the consultant at that time uh, produced a, basically, uh, he produced a blended rate uh, for both uh, septic and holding tank systems. And uh, what was happening is we had two separate rates for septic and holding, and uh, septic being more concentrated had a higher rate to it. Uh, but I, from an operational point of view, it was difficult to determine whether it was holding tank versus septic tank. And uh, so um, it was uh, approved at the time to, to come up with a blended rate. And, that the, and I don't have the exact figures in front of me, but it was around $33 a cubic meter. Uh, actually, the study came back with a higher amount than that. And uh, Kathy was there at the time, and the previous treasurer, they... they they looked. At, they double checked those numbers, and we actually tweaked it a little bit and came out with uh, a little bit of a lower lower rate. Still, it was thirty three dollars, but uh, we we did sort of because it was a significant change. We 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 double checked those numbers and we and we adjusted them uh, slightly. Um, so when that was presented to council, um, council at that time uh, decided to. Uh, keep the that rate for the septic however for the holding I believe they they kept with the same rates which is around six or seven dollars a, a cubic meter um, the following year that got raised to ten dollars a cubic meter uh, with the promise of a report report to come back to council with with options for for holding tanks so council of the day I, I, I presume listened to their constituents and and uh, didn't go with with the higher rate uh, for holding tank and keeping in mind the rates are set for full cost recovery. That's why those rates were set at the time. That was a principle adopted by council to have separate systems pay for themselves. So when you have a holding tank or septic, there is a separate system that you know receives the truck and, and, and things of that nature. Uh, so those costs are different. And the, the, um, uh, the concentration is different as well. And if there's any questions about that, I am not the expert that's across the room. Um, so. The report that came back to council uh, had four options. Status quo, where we would phase in the, the increase uh, to $33. Uh, the second option was a, we sort of did a benchmark with other municipalities. Uh, if I remember correctly, that was about 19 and change per cubic meter. Um, and then another option was um, uh, going right to the blended rate right away. And the last option was uh, what, what, I, what we call, we, we would subsidize the rate. So at the time, we, we came up with uh, about 14 or $15. Here it is right here. It was, uh, sorry, it was $20 and, $21.50, uh, and that was a 40% subsidy. Uh, however, that was 
at council of that day thought uh, that was still a little bit too high, so we went with $12 a cubic meter, and it ended up being 64.4% subsidized by other ratepayers. So what we did for 2019 is we kept that same rate of subsidiza subsidization. So the rates that you're seeing before you for holding tank, yes, there is a, an increase to it, but that increase is as a result of uh, the different volumes uh, that we calculated uh, based on uh, last year's uh, uh, volumes as well as cost differences, uh, but keeping the same 64.4% subsidized uh, uh, of the other of their other rates to keep the, the dollar amount low. So um, that's where we're at today. Uh, if council wants to change the rate of subsidization, either uh, up or down, uh, that'll obviously affect uh, the rate. Um, the uh, amount of increase, uh, Kathy, I believe to uh, the, the revenue that we're getting is approximately twenty twenty three thousand uh, dollars If we were to just to give you a bit of a context, if we were to keep it at twelve dollars, it would we we would require another uh, twenty one twenty two thousand dollars from the rest of the ratepayers in order to uh, to keep that status quo. The one thing I was I I, I am kind of disappointed that's not in here um, is an inventory of each of these items. So what is the estimate on each of these service charges and user charges and you know, a holding tank users, how many are we talking? I mean if you're able to produce the twenty two thousand number, how many holding tank users do we have? So the so we get the volume from I don't know how many providers we have, a half a dozen trucking companies out there that actually go to the holding tanks uh, to uh, put them in their trucks and then they bring their trucks to our treatment facility and then we process it. That's, uh, from, from what I understand, that's the only data we have uh, are on the trucks bringing it to our treatment facility. And we, so we... we so can, we would have a volume. We would, yeah, then, and right? that's part of that calculation. So we have, uh, we do have a calculation uh, to come up with that rate. It's based on uh, volume expenses uh, divided, and that's how the rate has come up with. I have a feeling that this isn't going to go f conclude today, but one of the things that I would like to see, and hopefully before possibly even tomorrow, I would assume that we would have, if, if this is on a cost recovery basis, we would have an inventory of the number of people that, you know, have flow, flow testing and pay X amount, the number of volumes of uh, holding tank waste that is brought into the system. Otherwise, these numbers are just arbitrary to me right now. So I would like to see an inventory on how we actually came to these, these figures. Um, and I think the other counselors would like to see that as well. I mean, we're pretty, I'm pretty good with numbers. So for me right now, I'm just looking at this and it's like a blanket, you know, sign off on it. And yet we've got no way to understand how if we manipulate that, those numbers that are in there, how that's going to change the rest of it. So would that be possible to produce that? I mean, again, if it's on a cost recovery basis, I wouldn't think that would be difficult to produce. I would hope not. Uh, yes, through you, Madam Mayor, we can get you how we calculate the rates. We can definitely provide that to council. Uh, Mr. Baird, I have a question for you then, or maybe Stephanie actually might even be better. In terms of the concentration, I understand that, uh, I've done a little bit of research into this, that if you are only treating holding tank waste as opposed to municipal waste, actually let's even switch this up. If you're only treating septic tank waste as opposed to municipal waste, that there is a significant higher concentrations in the septic waste and therefore it's more expensive to treat. However, holding tank waste, I believe it's like somewhere 70 to 90 percent, much like our home waste that is actually water-based as well because all of their gray water is going into the holding tank. So the argument that we keep hearing is that we have higher concentrations in holding tank waste and therefore it costs more to treat it but arguably it's the same gray water that's going into the holding tank and it's the same waste that's coming into the system and then further to that once you take that 
holding tank waste and now you dissolve it into the larger pool of waste, I think it would be tough to say that it's costing that much more to treat that particular waste. No? Thanks, Mayor Chop. Um, uh, we, do, we just know it's a much greater concentration. You're absolutely right. It's, the, it's, it's all the water, and it's probably got the same profile as it would on, on municipal wastewater coming into the plant. Um, the problem we have is uh, when a hauler uh, brings that waste to the plant, it's connected into the system. It's metered, so we know how much, how many cubic meters or, um, is being discharged. But we don't know what's in the truck. Is it septage? Is it from a, uh, a septic tank? Or is it holding tank water? It's only as good as what that hauler is providing. So there is a bit of unknown between when it goes from the truck into the plant. Um, so, so how do you reconcile that, though, with the arg that argument then being applied to holding tank waste, where it's the same composition as municipal waste? Because it's all their gray water is also going into it. It's absolutely no different. And yet the argument we keep hearing is that it costs more to treat it. OK, so it, costs, it certainly costs more to treat the uh, septic tank waste. I'll OK. Look, I might agree on um, that one. Uh, but keep in mind that anyone on a water, on a water system when you're paying your, your, your water bill, that includes the, the, uh, the sewage as well. Uh, so by every cubic meter of water that you're buying and being paid for, you're contributing towards the treatment of the, of the, uh, the, the sewage, the, the wastewater. If, if you're on a, a private well or a cistern where you're, you're bringing in bulk water, you're not paying for the sewage treatment. So if you're, if you're disposing of your wastewater into a municipal plant, that's the whole concept of user pay. Well, but then on that argument, then why are we splitting up the flat fees between water and sewage? Why wouldn't you just have one fee? If you're arguing that water needs to subsidize sewage and sewage needs to subsidize water, that makes no sense. I would just have one user fee then and not a blended. But I'm, I believe we've separated them out for this particular instance because some people have their own wells and some, you know. Correct, yeah. Um, and regarding that, the need for breaking down a water portion of sewer, the, those are experts there. I'll let Mr. Johnson or uh, Ms. LaPlante jump in to that. Uh, whether, I don't know, James? Uh, so the reason why we have separate rates for each service is there's, first of all, there's different costs for each service. So there's, we have a, a water budget and a, and a wastewater budget. So those costs are, are different. Uh, the other reason, probably uh, more importantly, is we do have some uh, customers that are on water, but they don't have wastewater, and vice versa. I know another municipality I, I worked at, they brought water in on cisterns, but they had a pond, one of those sewage lagoons nearby, and, and so we were charging them on wastewater, but not on water. But our water users, and for, correct me if I'm wrong, when people are on a well, they are still paying at least maybe it's just in town is that the bylaw that they're still paying a uh, a user a, a water user fee monthly despite the fact that they're not actually drawing any water from the system if you are connected to our system you have to pay for our system so, I've so had if you choose not to use it you still need to pay. I've for had it. an angry constituent recently that alerted me to this bylaw that who's on a well and he is having to pay a monthly flat fee, despite the fact that he's not drawing any water from the municipal system. So that's not necessarily the case. I, I don't know this individual that you're speaking of, but if, uh, and Chris, please feel free to jump in, but from my experience in doing water and wastewater billing, if you have uh, a pipe from your house to our system, uh, you need to pay for that service. If you decide to cut that pipe off and not be on our system, then that's, that's a different story. I don't think that's true. Maybe just a few comments to add, Mayor Chop. Um, so communities like St. Williams and Cortland, they're, they're provided uh, treated water from Norfolk County, but they have their own private disposal. All of those uh, uh, residences in, in those areas have their own septic tank or holding tank, perhaps. Um, so they only pay for the water portion. Um, the but I'm, I'm reversing this. Somebody that has their own well is paying for municipal flat rate water fee. Well, that, that, that shouldn't happen. If you have your own well, your water is in theory free with the exception of the equipment to pull water from the ground and the electricity to run the pump. 
if you're discharging that, if you have a private well and you're discharging into a municipal system, that's kind of contrary to uh, 